Everyone's got a day that changed their life. And I'm going to tell you about mine. It was a hot, muggy afternoon in New York City in the summer of 2005. I was 25 years old, and I had just spent some very formative years in New York. I had watched the World Trade Centers fall from my rooftop in Brooklyn. I had made the best friends I had made in my life. I had fallen in love with journalism and gone to Hunter College to get a degree in media studies. But by the summer of 2005, things had grown kind of dark. I don't know if you guys remember that summer or if it would mean the same thing to you that it did to me. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were raging. My chosen profession of journalism had been declared dead or dying. And I was facing graduation. That afternoon, I went down to Union Square with my two best friends, Alex and Jessica. We were going to a protest. And we showed up, and there was like nobody there. Anybody who has gone to a sparsely attended protest knows how depressing that can be. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it was my frame of mind that day, but I turned to Alex and Jessica, and I'm like, guys, if I buy you a coffee, can we get out of here? And they were like, yes. <laughs> so we walked down to Washington Square Park, and we stopped and got iced coffees along the way. And then we got to the park, and we sat down, in the scratchy, yellow grass of summer, cross-legged facing each other with our melting coffees. And I said, what are we going to do? Seriously, you guys, what are we going to do? I mean, it just seems like the country is on this terrible path, and there are these awful wars, and journalism, which all three of us really cared about, is on the skids. Even then, our friends were not getting jobs after graduation, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I remember it so clearly, Jessica turning to me and saying, I don't know. What would you do if you could do anything, Sarah? What would I do if I could do anything? What would I do if I could do anything? What would we do if we could do anything? It took us 20 minutes to answer that question. We would travel around the world telling stories that connected and inspired people. And we would tell them in new and innovative ways. It took us 20 more minutes to come up with the short list of people that we would have to beg and borrow the equipment from. And then a few months later, we had bought around the world plane tickets on credit cards. And we were off. And we were in Cambodia. The first story that we told was of a former child soldier who had laid landmines all over Cambodia as a kid and devoted himself as an adult to demining the country. All he had to do that with was a stick in his foot. He would feel around in the minefields for the mines, He'd pull them out with a stick. We followed him out to the minefields on mopeds. And he turned around and said, I hope you guys know how to ride one of these, because if you fall off here, you're going to die. And I was like, what? We are really here. This is really happening. We are really telling these stories. We are really living this idea. We went to India, where we told the story of sex workers that were trying to legalize and unionize their profession. They wanted to protect themselves and take care of their families. We went to Pakistan, where we told the story of bonded laborers that had escaped slavery and were trying to help other bonded laborers do the same. Everywhere we went, we met people that were really up against it, experiencing hardship that I could only try and understand, and asking themselves what they could do for their lives, for other people's lives for the world. And then, of course, we were also teaching ourselves a new craft as we went along. 
So we were building a website in cramped little internet cafes, and we were finding translators by loitering outside of English language courses all around the world, trying to find someone who would do it cheap, right? And we were making radio stories in closets stuffed with pillows. And then the money ran out. And we came home to Seattle, our hometown, because all three of us knew that if we were going to build something, we were going to build it here, in this city that takes care of new ideas and encourages innovation. And we were so right, because we came back here and we had an organization. We called it the Common Language Project. And we had people here that wanted to write for us. We had people here that wanted us to write about them. People that put our stories in their newspapers and on the radio that helped us through our first fundraiser so that we could get an office. Six years later, we're based at the University of Washington. We support international reporting projects around the world. Haiti, Cuba, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, India. We teach entrepreneurial journalism to students here, teaching them how to go out in the world and find stories that matter. And we teach media literacy and media production to underserved kids all over the Seattle area. And of course, Alex and Jessica and I continue to travel, telling stories that connect and inspire. We were in the Middle East last year. We were in Pakistan the year before that. We were in East Africa the year before that. When we passed the six-year anniversary of the Common Language Project, this last August, we mark it from the day in the grass with the coffees in New York City. I thought about how we are really experiencing a very similar moment. Things have turned kind of dark again. And the future seems uncertain. And people are scared. And I hear a lot of people asking, what are we going to do? My students and my friends and my family. And we have to turn that question into, what would we do if we could do anything? This is a great audience to ask that question of. What would you do if you could do anything? This is a great city to ask that question in. What would you do if you could do anything? Thank you. <laughs>